Let me begin this introduction again. My apologies for the for the for the disruption right there. We wanted to welcome back everyone um, to our symposium today. Um, welcome back everyone who joined us yesterday. Um, as I said briefly earlier, um, if you were not able to join us, please be reassured we'll be posting materials from yesterday's session as well as um, today's session on our Epidemic Urbanism YouTube channel, which you have um, links to. So as with yesterday, we're going to start with our brief vision for this symposium um, as a way to introduce um, what's, what's coming up ahead today. Epidemic illnesses, not only a product of biology, but also of social and cultural phenomena, are as old as cities themselves. The recent pandemic of COVID-19 has put into perspective the impact of epidemic illness on urban life and exposed the vulnerabilities of the societies it ravages as much as the bodies it infects. How then can epidemics help us understand urban environments? What insights from the outbreak experience and response to previous urban epidemics might inform our understanding of COVID-19? As the title of this online symposium, Epidemic Urbanism suggests, our aim in convening the symposium is to bring together academics from a range of disciplines to present case studies from across the globe in order to demonstrate how cities in particular are not just the primary place of exposure and quarantine, but also the site and instrument of intervention. Further, the presentations that we will see over these two days, uh, yesterday and today, cover a range of illnesses and epidemics, geographies, time periods, and urban interventions. These presentations also offer observations on the impact of these epidemics on society and urban life, and they give us new insights to understand, critique, and complexify the conception of and response to COVID-19 today. Though diverse in content, these presentations follow a common structure. Each shares the story of a city, an outbreak of illness, and the city's response to the epidemic. In so doing, each presentation addresses the occurrence of an epidemic or widespread illness in a specific geographical context, then illuminates the employment of urban design, architecture, landscape, or urban experience in response to the illness or epidemic. Our ultimate goal is to use these case studies to provide insights to today's COVID-19 pandemic and our response both today and in the future. Our first session yesterday on urban governance examined how urban interventions during times of epidemic illnesses were justified, carried out, and with what effect, intended or otherwise. Our, panel, our panelists explored the machinations of politics and city management, their instrumentality and intervention in a time of illness, and the long lasting impact of each on cities. The second session also yesterday on urban infrastructure examined built urban forms and elements and how they were created, mobilized and or modified in response to epidemics. As we saw, though this infrastructure was material and in many cases designed with permanence in mind, inhabitants moved to and through these structures and at times resisted or adopted them to suit their needs. The next two themes will comprise today's symposium, urban life and urban design and planning, highlighting four main principles of urbanism. These four sessions aim at addressing the major role that epidemics and pandemics have played in shaping the world in which we live today. In addition to these sessions, in order to further explore and provoke conversation about these and other ideas, at the end of the day, we will share our own observations and provocations and dedicate 20 to 30 minutes to Q&A. We invite your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Please stay until the end of the symposium that when we will reflect on amplif and amplify the major findings and contribution of this two-day symposium. Our third session of this symposium is on urban life and examines how epidemic illnesses exploited and uh, amplified social divisions and how epidemic interventions were leveraged against uh, experience and navigated by different communities. In the four papers comprising this session, we will explore the impact of pandemics on social practices more generally and on on inequality, racial and ethnic tensions and displacement more specifically, and indeed, more importantly. Our first speaker will be Stefan Pradines, who is a professor of Islamic art and architecture at the Aga Khan University in London. 
He is a specialist of trade and Islamization in the Indian Ocean from the Swahili coast to uh, the Maldives. He is also a specialist of warfare in medieval Africa. He was the director of the excavations of the walls of Cairo in Egypt from 2000 to 2016. He is now in charge of the excavations of the fort of Lahore in Pakistan. Good morning or good afternoon. First, I would like to thank Kathleen and Mohamed for inviting me to this fantastic conference. I will speak about Egypt and Cairo, one of the best known and well-documented city during the medieval Middle East. Next. A well-known history of the Cairo of the Mamluks are the plague epidemic and the Black Death. These plague epidemics were described in detail by historians, but never observed physically. During this presentation, I will develop two main points. First, all the Mamluks responded to epidemic crisis by changing their funerary, Muslim funerary practice. Second, all the plague epidemics impacted and changed the urban history of Cairo. Next. Only sultans and important figures of the empire were buried in mausoleum attached to mosque and madrasa in the city. The rest of the population were buried in the necropolis outside the city. During the medieval period, Cairo has two major necropolis or city of death, Karafa al Kubra and Karafa al Sugra. They were located outside the city in the desert for sanitation reasons. Next. Wooden coffins were only used to transport the defense to the cemetery as we do today. The bodies were wrapped in shrouds, kefen, of one or two pieces of cotton. In Cairo, the bodies are oriented north south with the face toward the southeast facing Mecca. In Muslim funerary practice, one grave always corresponds to one individual. Next. During our field work, we exhumed two uh, streets parallel to the city wall built by Salah ad -Din. Modest Mamluk houses were built along these streets in the early 13th century. al makrizi described this zone as Ben and Surin, the area between the walls, the Ayyubid and the Fatimid walls. In 2001-2002 and 2008-2009, we excavated a large Mamluk cemetery that was built over the abandoned district of Ben and Surin and the previous occupation. The number of individuals excavated was around 77, but the number of graves identified was much higher, probably around 300-400 people in the area of the archaeological triangle. The majority of the excavated burials consisted of simple individual graves and they were not epidemic burials. Next. Nevertheless, we observed many graves or funerary pits in multiple deposits of individuals layer, layered on top of each other or in just positions very close to each other in larger pits. We recorded graves with two to five individuals in the same pits. These burials have been documented by field anthropologists and the evidence are clear. clear. The position of the skeletons touching each other but not disturbing the bones and the absence of soil separating the body, bodies clearly indicate simultaneous deposition of simple superimposed uh, individuals and sometimes more. The unusual uh, height number and of simultaneous burials is evidence of mortality crisis, probably an epidemic. Next. Several graves contain a blackish residue in contact and around the bodies. This substance could be an application of nat naphtha or natural oil on the shroud, especially as some bones presented some discoloration showing that they were exposed to fire. Next. As previous mentioned, uh, previously mentioned, sorry, uh, or archaeological data overlaps text of famous medieval chroniclers such as Indumak or in, and Imnias. The Great Plague or Black Death from 1349-1365 would have reduced the population of Egypt by a third, and around of one million people died from it. Egypt also suffered from repeated plague epidemics outbreaks from 1469 to 1513. Thanks to the stratigraphy and the study of archaeological layer, we proved that the cemetery dates from the 14th and 15th century, mainly because the graves were dug over or sometimes through the previous occupation layers dating from the 13th century. 
between the late 13th century to the mid 14th century, the eastern district of Babel Barkia, uh, Babel Suren, sorry, was abandoned and subsequently fell into ruins. Hence, we have an example of a neighborhood neglected and converted into a cemetery from the mid 14th century to the late 15th century under the Circassian Mamluk. This illustrates the famous, the famous ruins of Cairo that was described by Al Makrizi. The plague had a profound impact on the urban landscape, and the entire neighborhood in eastern Cairo was, were abandoned. Next. On this Italian um, spy, uh, map of an Italian spy, Matteo Pagano, the cemetery was still in use in the late 15th and very early 16th century. Next. The map shows the presence of Torbay or mausoleum in the eastern area in Rim. Next. The cemetery was still widely used during the Ottoman period, as it is mentioned on the map of the description of Egypt in 1798-1801. Next. Many graves were still visible on, a photography, on photography in early 20th century. Next. To conclude, first, the cemetery of Babel Gore presents serious evidence of the plague epidemics during the 14th and 15th century in Egypt. The cemetery was situated in the city, but this was not the usual practice and correspond to a quick reaction to the ep an epidemic crisis. The excavations revealed mass graves that indicated that groups of people have been buried in the same pit and in Uri. Some human bones display evidence of being burned. This funerary practice is not usual in Islam and might have been admitted in times of epidemic crisis. As we can see today, Muslim authorities all over the world are responding to COVID-19 by pushing people to stay home and not socialize, even during the period of Ramadan. So the epidemic crisis transcends religion and people have to adapt to adopt a collective response. Our second discovery was to have a better understanding of the limit of the medieval Cairo. Medieval Cairo was much larger than was, was described by the historian before our research. In 1348, the Black Death had a deep impact on the urban landscape, pushing people to abandon the whole eastern district of the city. Unfortunately, it, it's the same with the COVID-19. This epidemic will, will also have a deep impact on our economic and urban life. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stefan. Our next speaker is jo Joshua Teplitsky, who is an ass assistant professor of history at Stony Brook University. He earned a PhD in Hebrew and Judaic studies and, uh, and history at York, uh, New York University. His book, Prince of the Press, How One Collector Built History's Most Enduring and Remarkable Jewish Library, was just recently published by Yale University Press in 2019. In the cities and towns of what was once Habsburg, Bohemia, and Moravia, the memory of plague was often built into the public spaces of urban life. Looming over many a town square stands a Marian column, a memorial pillar atop which rises the Virgin Mary, glorious in her triumph over two contagions, the heresy of Protestantism and epidemic disease. These columns mingle civic commemoration with imperial pomp, and defined the dominant culture of Habsburg urban space in the centuries following the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Like much of the rest of the continent, which experienced an outbreak of pestilence at least once a generation during this period, the cities of the Habsburg monarchy lived under the regular threat of disease. Epidemics struck in 1649, in 1679-80, and one final time in the late summer of 1713, the outbreak which I will focus on in my remarks today. While the Marian columns of the city represent collective piety of its Catholic majority, they obscure the epidemic experiences of a sizable population that lived outside of the Catholic fold, its large Jewish community. The apparent collective grace expressed by these civic memorials stand in stark relief to the ways in which the plague affected minorities, both as victims of epidemic trauma, as well as discriminatory human-made policies to which it was subjected. Yet to be a minority was not necessarily to be subject to popular uprising and violence, nor did it demand absolute hostility. 
In this brief presentation, I will focus on the city of Prague in the year 1713 to explore the ways that moments of plague engendered instances of discrimination, but also reveal points of cooperation and coexistence as epidemic history serves as a useful, if painful, point of entry to contemplate both. Prague had featured a Jewish presence since the early Middle Ages, and by the start of the 18th century, the number of Jews had risen to over 11,000, making the Jewish population nearly a third to a quarter of the total urban number. A tolerated minority in the city, in fact, more tolerated than Protestants, Jews enjoyed the formal protection of the Habsburg monarchs on account of their economic utility. Prague's Jewish ghetto, which is here, give or take, held a semi-autonomous status marked both spatially and politically and was separated from the rest of the city accessible through gates. It had its own town hall in which sat a Jewish elected leadership, its own places of worship, a separate welfare sector of schools, midwives, apothecaries, and surgeons. But it was also an overcrowded site with thousands of residents distributed through only a few hundred buildings. When the plague struck Prague in July of 1713, the Habsburg offices paid particular attention to this crowded urban area. Edicts issued from the capital in Vienna regularly offered a set of instructions to the city of Prague as a whole, followed by a subset of orders to be imposed upon the Jewish town in particular, motivated by a desire to protect the non-Jewish residents of the city from excess association with Jews. This was felt, for example, most palpably when, on the 23rd of August, Habsburg policy crystallized around issues of enclosure, quarantining, and the shuttering of spaces. Within this policy, there was a marked difference between the Jewish neighborhood and the rest of the city. While the prescribed course of action for the city called for the sealing of individual homes, for the Jewish quarter, a wholesale enclosure of the entire neighborhood was mandated. Such attempts to manage city space had unforeseen consequences for the movement of individuals. Repeated edicts sent from Vienna to Prague in the later weeks of August of 1713 and the start of September reveal that the closure of the ghetto was only slowly accomplished. This in turn resulted in movement, inward migration of masses of vagrant Jews who had been driven from the countryside into the city, as well as the flight out of the city of wealthier Jews towards safer, unafflicted locales both of which the monarchy feared would transport infection onward. In dealing with these flows of mobility, the state did not adopt a preformed policy. Its response evolved over time. In the first weeks of the epidemic, the state initially defended Jews' ability to travel with limited hindrance, and only later pivoted towards a sweeping ban on all forms of Jewish mobility, even for those carrying documentation attesting to their movement from unaffected places. It thus bears noting that in contrast to the infamous Black Death, neither state nor society directed its unbridled angst against the Jewish population. And while the ghetto may have been subject to neglect, it was never the victim of direct assault or physical persecution. Moreover, to the eye of the historian, both the enclosure of the space of the ghetto and the curtailment of Jewish mobility beyond the city offer evidence of segregation as a concerted project to change the norm. The regulations that limited Jewish-Christian contact can be productively read by historians to offer evidence for the bonds of neighborliness that preceded the crisis. This is evident, for example, from edicts demanding a cessation of mingling between Christian and Jewish domestic servants, especially washerwomen, from which we can deduce evidence for the rhythms of normal social contact. The same holds on the opposite end of the social spectrum as when an edict condemned, quote, those healthy Jews, end quote, who in their flight from the city feared for the belongings they would necessarily leave behind and deposited their goods not with other Jews, but with Christian householders in the healthier areas outside the Jewish town. And so although the state condemns such a practice, its very mention reflects longstanding relations between at least some denizens of the city and of trust across confessional lines, not of unmitigated hostility. The Prague Plague of 1713 claimed a third of the lives of the city's residents, a proportion that roughly obtained throughout the neighborhoods. For the Jews, a combination of long-standing urban neglect and direct discrimination resulted in not only a horrific number of deaths, but also in the erosion of institutional order, in chaos and in emotional and psychological trauma, 
as well as lasting guilt and pain at the indignity in which the dead were cared for. And this was not the end of their troubles. A month after the worst of the plague subsided, the authorities began to devise a strategy to further reduce the Jewish population of Prague through legislation. What might we learn then from this episode for the COVID pandemic? We would of course be rash to draw immediate lines from past to present, but the archival history of differentiated policies as they apply to different social spaces and different communities might give us pause in thinking about the present. My goal in this presentation has been to gesture towards the dynamics and dynamism of plague response in this urban center, and to think about how a view from minority experience exposes inconsistencies and preconceptions of policymakers on the one hand, and social contexts on the other. We are reminded from the case of Prague in 1713 that not every epidemic eventuates in wide-scale violence, yet we must also be attuned to the vulnerability of minorities outside the perceived mainstream to be neglected by public health works or to disproportionately feel the impact of an epidemic. One lesson, I think, then, is to attend to the array of pressures at work, psychological, cultural, institutional, social, and economic, that compound the experience of epidemic. Aspects of the handling of epidemic in the 18th century scenario offered quite a dull instrument, condemning entire neighborhoods or entire subsets of the population, which caused great hardship, even as it may, but only may, have contributed to the overall public health of the city. We can learn from the past to be attentive to difference and to think not only about the politics of blame, but also the politics of indifference, relegation, and neglect of leaving some populations to fend for themselves without the full arsenal of the resources available for the common good. The encounter between Jews and Christians in plague-ridden Prague can also give us occasion, though, to look beyond statistics and prescriptive policy to sensitively uncover longer and deeper rhythms of engagement and to consider the domains in which neighbors across social divides shared urban spaces, to think about the structures of daily and civic life that brought them together. Because much as the Habsburgs might have liked, disease seldom respects walls, boundaries, or borders, and we are only as healthy as our least healthy neighborhood. Thank you. Our next speaker is Fezanur Karachalioglu, who earned a BA in History and Byzantine Archaeology and Art History from the Heidelberg University and an MA degree in History from the Bogazici University in Istanbul. Her research is focused on the history of the Latins in the Ottoman Empire and the social, cultural, and urban histories of medicine. Hello, thank you, and welcome to my presentation. I'll talk about the early 19th century Frankish district of Istanbul, Galata Opera. It is usually studied and known for its Catholic landscape and multicultural urban space. Galata Opera was also a landscape of disease and plague had a highlighted presence. With the second pandemic, it never left the city until the strict quarantine measures were started to be implemented from the end of 1838 onwards. Next slide, please. The fact that from the 18th century on, plague subsided in Europe led to a significant divergence in its epidemiological experience. So in Europe, it came to be associated with the Levant. Miket Varlik speaks of a spatial anchoring in this regard. In addition, the concepts of progress and civilization, and also poverty, started to be given as reasons for the occurrence of plague. The Orient and plague were thought of as belonging with each other due to the perceived Islamic fatalism, inefficient governments, and the absence of the institution of quarantine and lazarettos. Istanbul, Cairo, and Alexandria were thought to be the places of plague's origin. Istanbul proper was the old triangular shaped city on the peninsula. Beyond the Golden Horn was the walled city of Galata established by the Genoese during the Middle Byzantine period. The area was scarcely settled before then and used during the first pandemic to bury the corpses. During the second pandemic, usually people who died from plague were buried in the Christian and Muslim cemeteries of Pera, the extramuros extension of Galata, where gravestones would inform on the death codes. They served at the same time as spaces for people to go on a promenade, although they were also associated with the miasmas. Slide, please. Galata was densely built and populated, the majority of the newer buildings were made of timber. The cracks in them happened to be the optimal places for flea eggs to grow, and the streets were waterlogged, unpaved, and narrow. Pera had begun to develop as the Faborg of Galata, among others, as a result of the wish to avoid plague. So it does not surprise that several churches and altars here were dedicated to the plague saints or the Panaya. Slide, please. 
There were plague hospitals in the district administered by the Christians. These hospitals received who could not afford private medical care. It was the priests who took care of the patients. They would also be the ones keeping the track of the disease and spreading the news about it. They would also lead the funerary processions, carrying a long stick to ensure the distance and warn the passers-by that a plague victim was being carried to, the, to be inhumed. They were known for their courage, but they themselves were convinced that they were being saved thanks to God's favor upon them. Nonetheless, people did fear these hospitals as much as they feared plague and would rather avoid walking past them. They were considered as the portals to the grave. The northern end of the main artery in the district with its cemeteries and hospitals was a gloomy place where the phantom of the plague resided. In the European accounts, we encounter the evaluations of the district which reflect interest in hygiene. In the 19th century, hygiene indicated, as Jan Kisatsky writes, I quote, the rules structuring the healthy interaction of people with their environment, unquote. In our context, habits of hygiene included the practice of quarantine and the related sanitary measures. Wearing the vaxxed, black taffetas clocks outside counted among these, but one had to endure being subjected to ridicule in Istanbul. Galata Pera was a place where people with different approaches to flag met each other. They appeared to be distinct in themselves to such an extent that they could correspond to ethno-religious groups or were presented as such. Whether one imposed self-quarantine or quarantine or not, and whether one feared the plague or not, were the points to which much attention was paid. Accordingly, one is presented with a spectrum of reactions ranging from total reliance on the providence and predestination, which was associated with the Muslims in the first place, to the extremes of panic and anxiety, which were associated with the Europeans and the Levantines. Slide, please. People's socioeconomic background determined their roles in the days of plague as well. The better of families, especially the embassies, European merchants and the Levantines would leave Galatapera in the plague season and settle in the northern villages on the Bosporus. Slide, please. They're quite lucky to claim their air, space and light, which helped them avoid contagion. But ironically, these villages provided the less lucky people with a destination as well. On these hills, one could also come across plague or cholera patients abandoned and hidden by their families. Slide, please. To turn back to Galata Pera, all the business relations and tasks had to continue. The Levantine or European shop owners would hire non-Muslim Ottomans, be they locals or migrants from the archipelago or Anatolia, to engage in buying and selling in the city. Families who stayed in Pera would employ their servants and maids for the supplies but keep looking at them with suspicion because they would not count on their caution and think they would keep it a secret if they caught the disease. If a death from plague took place in a house, every member would start living in tents till the house and the family's possessions were disinfected. The seamen made up also a group which was the most subject to infection and suspicion. Sharing the same space with them, with them was seen as a potential danger. And there were the dragomans and Catholics from the city proper, where it was impossible to avoid human contact and where people wouldn't care about the precautions. Every perot house would be locked up and every visit would put the families in fear. If one were let in, they would be first taken into a fumigation booth. The fear of plague hindered the social life clearly with no social gathering taking place, plagues being the concluding theme of every conversation and no shaking hands. In the beginning of the 19th century, we encounter only a limited number of cases where the state intervened in the urban life due to plague. People were not forced to move out of the center, it was their choice. But from the late 1830s on, we see that in the empire, the emergence of the discourse on public hygiene was directly related with the fight against plague and the implementation of the quarantine measures, which were known as the Frankish measures, hence with the attempt to synchronize with Europe and belong to the in, qu in quotation marks, healthier part of the world. So the experience of plague was accompanied by a change in the mindset as well. The conceptualization of and the narratives around plague should be deemed equally important. Studying plague in Pera can be a relevant historical example to illustrate that emotional and practical reactions to contagious diseases influence experiencing and thinking about cities. Pera was a place people could associate with abandonment, untimely death and danger due to plague. The fear of contagion and the distrust regarding the other's caution restricted experiencing the city freely and socially. The question of the practice of regulated isolation may divide not only the globe, but the cities and neighborhoods into zones of health and disease and the zones of peacefulness and anxiety today again. As far as Istanbul was concerned, the role of the adaptation of the quarantine measures 
the changes that occurred in the urban structure with regard to the choice of construction material, orderly paving of the streets was obviously great. The experience of plague did lead to the processes of medicalization of space, so medical theories found themselves a place as red threats to be followed once the state decided to fight the spread of plague. We may, we may witness similar processes and trends in terms of learning from each other. Social distance, disinfection and limitation are establishing themselves as keywords like they have done before. Perceiving the cities with certain pathogenic and benign characteristics, not only of the landscapes, but also of the habits of the population, would be again among the major reasons for urban changes. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Feza Noor. The last presentation in this session on urban life will be presented by Desiree Waladares, who is a landscape architect and a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Her dissertation is attentive to federal preservation policy as it intersects with indigenous land claims and Asian North American redress and war memory. She places her legal and geographic focus on two former US territories, Hawaii and Alaska, and unceded lands in Canada's British Columbia. Hi everyone, I'm Desiree, and this is Tropical Disease and Prisoners of War in the American Pacific, 1941 to 1946. Next slide, please. So before he cooked up green eggs and ham or taught us how to count colorful fish, Dr. Seuss was a captain in the US Army. And during World War II, this author and illustrator, um, whose given name was Theodore Geisel, spent a few years creating training films and pamphlets for the troops. One of Geisel's army cartoons was a booklet aimed at preventing malaria outbreaks among GIs by urging them to use mosquito nets and keep covered up. Next slide, please. One of his brochures read, and I quote, this is Anne, she drinks blood. Her full name is Anopheles Mosquito, and she's just dying to meet you. Her trade is dishing out malaria. If you take a look at the map below, you can see where she hangs out, end quote. In this map, the Asia and Pacific region are shaded a blood red and identified as a malaria hotspot. Next slide, please. Today, I focus on this region to tell you about the capture and oceanic transport of World War II prisoners of war in the Pacific. And I hope to offer some insight into the longer history of emergency oceanic jurisdiction during wartime, in addition to the medical treatment of military, civilians, and non-citizen enemy alien bodies. And finally, I also hope to let you know about the use of DDT and other insecticides used by the US military to prevent the introduction and spread of tropical diseases. And I'm particularly interested in oceanic routes in the South Pacific where combatant and non-combatant prisoners of war were transported by ship to US military installations in Hawaii and the mainland, including Angel Island in San Francisco. Prisoners of war typically included men, women, children. Some were combatants, non-combatants, while others were labor conscripts. And they were mostly captives of Asian descent, descent from Taiwan, Okinawa, Japan, Korea, Saipan, Rota, and the Philippines. Next slide, please. Once captured, prisoners of war were transported to either stationary or roving US Navy medical ships where they were vaccinated and sprayed with DDT or dichloro, diphenyl, trichloroethane to control typhus carrying lice, to stamp out mosquito-borne malaria and other tropical diseases such as phalaricis, which was an infectious parasitic disease caused by a roundworm infection. And the US um, Army's Medical Department and Medical Corps Policy on Sanitation and Preventative Medicine during the Second World War conflated mosquitoes and other insect-borne diseases with imperial threats. Next slide, please. The military warned soldiers about the dangers of the disease with a very aggressive propaganda campaign that tried a variety of approaches, including patriotic appeals, racist caricatures, scare tactics, and goofy cartoons. These wartime posters by Theodore Geisel or Dr. Seuss depict the Asian or Japanese body and the mosquito of the Anopheles genus as similarly deadly enemies that require elimination. 
Next slide, please. So DDT was widely used to control malaria and typhus. The US military typically used aerosol versions and dustings on captured prisoners of war in an attempt to curb the spread and transmission of mosquito and insect-borne diseases. Next slide, please. And the US Army developed printed instructions to properly fumigate human bodies. The discourse of sanitation and disinfection through fumigation was applied not only to captured prisoners of war, but also extended to soldiers, civilians, as well as land masses and coastal waters. And it's clear that the military responded to the malaria outbreak with a full on assault. The Army's medical department dispatched malaria control units to war zones to clear and clean out standing water and bombard malarial areas. Uh, with insecticides like DDT in bug bombs. With the access to quinine cut off by the Japanese conquest of Java, the government sped up trials of the anti-malaria medicine Adabrine. Despite side effects such as turning the skin yellow, millions of tablets of the drug were distributed to troops toward the end of the war. And this discourse of ridding one's body of contagion mirrors current remarks about ingesting disinfectants, including hydrochloroquine to prevent COVID-19. The president and his administration has compared the fight against COVID to war and has included has incited racial tensions by declaring it the Wuhan virus. Next slide, please. So during the war, DDT also began to work its magic on the home front. Newspapers reported that in applications across the US, the pesticide was killing malaria carrying mosquitoes throughout the South and preserving Arizona's vineyards, West Virginia's orchards, Oregon's potato fields, Illinois' cornfields, and Iowa's dairies. It was deemed a magic mist that had the potential to secure and sanitize one suburban domestic space with, and I quote, just a twist of the wrist. It was quickly deemed a war-born miracle, so effective one could scarcely believe it. Next slide, please. So in wartime, DDT saved lives, but it did so by inflicting easily accepted collateral damage. In peacetime, however, DDT's negative effects on insects, birds, wildlife, and ecosystems warranted renewed consideration. When the War Production Board initially released DDT for sale to the public, it cautioned against the use of it to upset the balance of nature and added that if DDT was applied to the body, it could leave residues that might cause harm. Next slide, please. So with very little testing or conclusive results, uh, this insecticide was used widely uh, during World War II, not just in the Pacific region, but all across Europe, North America, and elsewhere. And it was used not only on prisoners of war, but also on, um, on the shores and territories and possessions of the Pacific. DDT seeped into these islands, lands, and waters as makeshift camps and army hospitals uh, popped up in close proximity to Honolulu Harbor in the then territory of Hawaii, which was under martial law. In these spaces, prisoners or prisoners of war were refumigated, their stool and blood tested, and they were further segregated or sorted to be shipped off to immigration stations or internment camps in the US mainland. In other instances, they were taken to the archipelago's longest running prisoner of war camp called Hana Uli Uli. Next slide, please. And the COVID crisis has prompted me to take a closer look at the US Army Corps of Engineers sanitation plan for Hana Uli Uli camp pictured here. And the camp held prisoners of war across the Pacific, um, Japanese civilians who were deemed suspicious and African-American infantry unit who guarded these racialized people were also stationed here. The sanitary and layout plan reveals how disparate populations were further segregated on land. This camp was located in the remote sugar plantations of Oahu's fertile inland plains, far away from the coast. And these strategies of segregation and concealment served to prevent the spread of tropical diseases, 
and keep this population relatively secluded from the rest of the island. And the spatial layout of the camp, though loosely guided by the stipulations of the Geneva Convention of 1929, shows how contagion, sanitation, waste, and disposal were intimately controlled and managed by the US military during wartime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desiree, and thank you so much for our panelists so far. We are now going to um, introduce our fourth and final session in this symposium entitled Urban Design and Planning. This, se this session is going to examine the role of urban design practices and concepts before, during, and after epidemics and the factors that shaped and codified each from the benign to bureaucratic to even the more nefarious and the longer term implications for urban design, urban life, climatic zoning, and natural environments. Our first speaker in this session is Carlo Trombino, who is a PhD student at the University of Palermo, Department of Culture and Society. He holds an MA in history at the University of Bologna. He's currently working on a multimedia research project on the 16th to 17th centuries Mediterranean slave trade with a focus on Mercedarian order and other redeeming institutions in Sicily and Catalonia. Good morning, everyone. My presentation concerns the urban design developed by Giovanni Filippo Ingrassia during the 1576 plague in the city of Palermo. The measures adopted by Giovanni Filippo Ingrassia helped tackle the disease by using a rational scientific method in managing patients and the whole population. Ingrassia was one of the most famous scientists of his era. He had already written several books and was a pioneer in social epidemiology. He was appointed to guide the scientific task force working for the, for the government to contain the epidemic by creating a network of public hospitals and a strict protocol discussed with the physicians working on the field. The measures adopted in order to contrast the plague in the city of Palermo are carefully described in the book you will see in the next slide. Here you can see the cover of the original 1576 version of the Informazione del Pestifero e Contagioso Morbo, written during that same year by Ingrassia. This book became one of the most important analyses of the disease in that period, and for this reason it was translated into German and Latin and had a wide diffusion all throughout Europe, setting a benchmark for future emergency responses to epidemic outbreaks. It offers us the complete report of his intervention with a detailed description of his epidemic urban planning. The cover, as you can see, presents the main aspects involved during the emergency. The gold in the left rectangle, which symbolizes the economic measures taken during the emergency in the city. Then on the right, the fire reminds of the hygiene protocol adopted in order to contain the spread of the disease. At the bottom, gallows and ropes are depicted to remind everybody of the strict and unkind laws applied to all of those who didn't abide to them. In the center of the cover, the allegory of justice. Ingracia's thought was influenced by philosophers such as Marsilio Ficino and Aristotle, but he also discussed his proposals with experts in different disciplines and, of course, the political and religious powers. Urbanistic changes were one of the main interventions he did in order to contrast the spread of the deathly disease. Slide. As you can see from this map of the city of Palermo, the old walled city pictured at the bottom is where the vi virus spread. Ingresia decided to put it on lockdown and nobody could enter by land or by sea. From an urbanistic and organizational point of view, Ingresia intervened by creating hospitals and forcing monasteries to host quarantine patients. Then, specific areas were arranged in order to manage plague-related processes, such as washing the laundry, burning the infected goods, or giving a shelter to those who needed. He soon realized that he could not stop the contagion if the infected were inside of the walled city. That's why he intervened in the immediate surroundings. 
with epidemic urban planning that boosted the creation of new baroques and reshaped the urban space. These places are pictured in the book, as we can see with more detail from the extracts in the following slide. The drawing on the right depicts a well-known building in the city of Palermo, which is called La Cuba. This building pre-existed the coming of the plague and dates back to the Arab Norman period. Ingracia decided that this place would have hosted plague patients. The buildings surrounding the main one are also instrumental to this purpose. There is the houses of physicians on the left and on the bottom. And at the base of the palace, we can see uh, some buildings which were the male and female patients' halls, while outside on the right, there were the recovering women building. Between them, strateg strategically placed in a well-connected, well-isolated part of the city, we can see gallows and instruments of torture, creating a vivid example of epidemic urban planning. The second image on the left shows Borgo Santa Lucia, and this was another urban planning intervention. As Ingrosia ordered the draining of the swamps, pictured at the bottom, to make the place healthier, and also he gave a boost to the re renovation of the house households that you can see on the bottom left in order to isolate the suspects, which means the relatives of those who died. Those works implemented the urbanization of that hamlet by creating new water sources and using those available in a new, more effective way. This epidemic urbanization soon became the natural extension of the city to its northern route, a process that continued in the centuries following that period until very recent times. Ingrosia convinced the Duke of Bivona to host in his garden, pictured at the center of the left image, to host the cleaning, sanitization, or burning of infected goods. And this whole urban intervention was intended to fight the disease. The newly built and renovated houses were intended for the social distancing of the suspects who, unlike the rich, could not afford to safely quarantine at home. This explains the deep understanding he had of the social environment he lived in as he intervened to solve the structural problems people could have faced when trying to isolate inside their own houses. His interest for the well-being of the more disadvantaged sector of society led in Russia to another epidemic urbanistic intervention inside the world this time, as we can see in the next slide. If somebody visits Palermo today, he won't notice rivers crossing the city, but we know that the city was rich in water causes, which made it a lush and blooming capital. One of the rivers which crossed and still crosses underground Palermo is the Papireto River. This map shows us the intervention of burial of the river and the reclamation of the swamps, which was intended to prevent the spread of other infections and diseases in the future in one of the poorest parts of town, reshaping urban space and creating a continuum between the Capo neighborhood and the southern suburbs. In the next slide, we can see a visual representation of the victory over the plague when city went back to normality. The disease was beaten and religious and social life restarted as it was before the outbreak. There wasn't what today we call new normal, because new normal is just the perpetuation of the emergency. In Russia instead had an emergential approach, but he also saw the emergency as an opportunity to improve the health system. And urban design was indeed part of a new integra integrated public health system. In Russia was able to tackle the disease by reshaping the urban space in order to give the population a healthy living space and especially to the more disadvantaged people, like women often re referred to in his book, and the lower economic classes, by sanitizing swamps and the burial of the Papireto River, the creation of several hospitals, and the boosting in housing projects outside of the world. Epidemic urban design was intended very differently than today. Ingrasia urban design was not intended to stop normality to create a new normal. It was aimed at improving the living condition to continue life as it was before, and urban space was crucial to that. While creating a new, healthier urban space, 
in Gracia also advocated for the hanging and public torturing of thieves and of those who intentionally spread the disease, as we saw in the first cover picture. He purposefully created an urban landscape of tortured bodies to scare the population into respecting the norms. But this was only a response to an epidemic emergency, and it enabled him to create a procedure that eventually helped the city recover from another plague epidemic 50 years later in 1624. Today, it seems that however useful emergency measures want to be used by governments to create a, to create a new normality where emergency is the norm, but instead it is possible to rethink the, um, the human and urban space to create better living condition for the whole population. And I think that in this sense, we can learn from Inglesia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. Our next speaker is Andrew Wells, who is a cultural historian of the early modern Atlantic world. He obtained his doctorate in modern history at the University of Oxford. He's, an author, he's the author of a dozen articles and book chapters dealing with topics ranging from the cultural history of the Titanic disaster to the history of racism in the pre-modern world. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Mohammed and Caitlin for organizing such a great colloquium. This paper is about just how much we have in common with 17th century city dwellers in our shared fight against epidemic disease. It also emphasizes the fact that our forebears had certain tools available to combat some of the social and cultural side effects of pandemics that we badly need. This need appears even more stark given the large common ground we share. Next slide, please. An important first step in establishing the historical context of my case study is to strip away the layers of myth that have surrounded the plague since its disappearance from England in the mid 1660s. Such myths began to accrue, if not during the Great Plague of 1665 to 6, then soon after. And this drawing by the artist Alfred Montague, which depicts the burial of the dead near St. James Priory Church in Bristol, shows the Victorian romanticization of the Great Plague in full swing. In reality, this outbreak of bubonic plague, which was so devastating in London, actually hit Bristol fairly lightly in comparison with epidemics in earlier decades. Archaeological evidence shows that there were neither mass, hurried, nor undecorous burials at St. James's during the epidemic. And of course, romanticizing the last major outbreak of epidemic plague could only occur once it was firmly established that 1665 to 6 was the last outbreak, something about which Britons could not be confident until well into the 18th century. Next slide. So the focus of this paper is on the city of Bristol in southwest England. It was an important port, not yet the second city of England that it was to become after 1700, but still key, as testified by the efforts of royalists and parliamentarians to gain control of the city during the Civil War. It had changed hands twice during that conflict, succumbing to a royalist siege in 1643 and then returning to parliamentary control in 1645, and both sieges coincided with outbreaks of epidemic disease, first of typhus and then of plague. Both of these hit harder than the outbreak of the mid 1660s. By that date, the city was recovering economically and politically from the dislocations of civil war and revolution. In common with many English cities, it was run by an urban oligarchy, but had a comparatively large electorate with an open franchise for all freemen and boasted a total population of roughly 15,000. The contemporary map shown on the right it indicates how Bristol was centered on the space between two rivers, the Avon and the Froom. And you can see these from the ships and other vessels depicted. This central zone, which takes up vertically the middle third of the map, contained the most ancient parishes in which lived the wealthiest citizens, and their poorer fellow Bristolians lived to the south and the east, where there was much open space by the roads to London and Gloucester. Next slide, please. This slide shows the social geography of the city more closely, and we can see that reported cases of the plague occurred in the poorer parts of the city during the 1665 to 6 outbreak. The large area bordered in red was St Philip's Parish, which came to be so infected because it was on the London Road and because of certain measures introduced by the city to, pro <coughs> excuse me, to combat the disease. As today, there was real fear that continued economic activity would promote the spread of illness. 
So one of the first measures undertaken by Bristol's Common Council was to spend a considerable amount of money to persuade the King's Privy Council to issue a proclamation banning the holding of St James's Fair in the city. They spent about £24 or about US dollars in today's money. Now this had been done in the past during outbreaks of plague, but was controversial. In 1637, a group of London traders successfully petitioned the Privy Council to be allowed to travel to Bristol, which was granted as long as they bore certificates of health from the Lord Mayor of London. Further measures were passed in June 1665 to force householders in the city to keep watch and guard the city's gates, only allowing in Londoners with these certificates of health. Their goods, however, had to be left outside the city for a period of 30 days so they could be aired, in accordance with widely held notions that miasma produced infectious disease. These goods were all held just outside Lawford's Gate in St Philip's parish. Understandably, the owners of these goods would want to be housed near their merchandise, so this part of the city would have hosted a large proportion of Londoners entering the city. Next slide, please. Additional measures with implications for urban design and planning were taken as the plague threatened Bristol in late 1665 and into 1666. The Privy Council gave an order banning St Paul's Fair and pest houses were constructed or rented. On this slide, you can see three sites used in the 17th century for the relocation of plague victims. On the left is the Little Park, part of today's Tyndall's Park, where a number of huts were built for the infected during the plague of 1651. The two sites to the right, the Wistry and the building actually labelled the Pest House, were both sites used to house plague victims in 1665-6. Extensive construction work also took place at the latter site, and the city's bakers and doctors kept the sick supplied with bread and medicines. The Pest House still existed as late as the 1790s, by which time the association of disease with the northeast of Bristol and its adjoining hinterland had become cemented, due to the establishment of smallpox inoculation houses there in the 1760s and 1770s. Next slide, please. The relief efforts of the 1660s all cost money and the massive reduction in, in economic activity, coupled with the increase in taxation to pay for relief efforts, provoked resistance. Individuals tried to break into the city through the cordon sanitaire and were hauled in front of the city's magistrates. On the Gloucestershire side of Lawford's Gate, where the urban authorities had no jurisdiction, Londoners congregated with their goods in the hope that the St Paul's Fair would still take place. They had to be dispersed. Above all, people were slow to pay their share of the taxes imposed to meet these costs. In early 1666, the city authorities forbade wealthy Bristolians from leaving the city because of the plague without first paying a sum as security against further levies. But the doctor, Baker and Carpenter who served the pest houses were still waiting in 1667 to receive payment for their efforts. There were even attempts to take financial advantage of Bristol's plight. The nearby city of Bath spread the false rumour that plague was still raging at Bristol in mid-1666 in the hope of having its St James's Fair relocated there. Yet what did not occur and what I want to highlight in closing was the blatant exploitation of the epidemic as individuals attempted to profiteer by hoarding supplies that were needed and selling them at a profit. We've all seen such stories of people and indeed governments hoarding hand sanitizer, toilet rolls and even personal protective equipment during the COVID-19 crisis. But such activities were far rarer in the case of Bristol's 17th century plague. The reasons for this are simple and hence do not appear in the documentary record of the plague itself. As everywhere else in early modern England, Bristol had very strong regulations and penalties against the common law offences of regrating, forestalling and, in, and engrossing. Regrating was the practice of buying goods and reselling them in or near the very same place to artificially inflate their price. Forestalling involved buying goods before they came to market, preventing sellers from coming to market or persuading traders to hike up the price. And engrossers, bought up large quantities of a product to monopolise supply. Present day profiteers are arguably guilty of all three of these offences and would have enjoyed no sympathy from early modern people in the best of times, let alone during an epidemic. We too have a moral repugnance for such acts, particularly in a time of crisis. And yet such behaviour is perceived to be, if not an acceptable part of neoliberal capitalism, then a regrettable but unavoidable side effect.
By ditching what historians have termed a moral economy, characteristic of early modern economic life, we've made ourselves vulnerable to unscrupulous individuals. The common ground we share with Bristolians of 1665 to 6 in our efforts to conquer epidemic disease only makes this attempted exploitation more naked and unmistakable. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Our next speaker is Irina Davidovich, who is a senior a researcher and, uh, and she leads the G GTA Institute doctoral program at ETH Zurich. She obtained her master's in philosophy and doctorate in the history and philosophy of architecture at the University of Cambridge. She is the author of Forms of Practice German Swiss Architecture between 1980 and 2000, and she and uh, the editor of Alan uh, Kolkuhan from Bricolage to Myth. Thank you, uh, Mohammed, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, the COVID crisis highlights parallels with how public health has historically shaped our cities. The cholera outbreaks in 19th century London focused attention on the city's insalubrious quarters as main centers and spreaders of disease. The fear of indiscriminate contagion triggered the reform for momentum to clear and rebuild the slums and the assumption of government responsibility for the built environment. My focus today is on its effects on housing. Next slide, please. Until the mid 19th century, it was widely believed that cholera was caused by miasma, a poisonous vapor caused by organic rot. The 19th century outbreaks that killed thousands of Londoners in 1832 and 1854 were associated with a succession of four cholera pandemics that changed the health landscape worldwide. In London, the so-called King Cholera was associated with the overcrowded, polluted environment of the city's poor. Opposing medical opinion at the time, the physician John Snow rejected that cholera was transmitted via foul air in his 1849 essay on the mode of communication of cholera. He gathered new evidence during the 1854 outbreaks when he correlated a cluster of cholera deaths to the Broad Street public water pump in St. Giles Rookery, current day Soho. The revised essay of 1855 included a map of Snow's findings connecting the concentration of deaths to the water supply. Upon examination, this pump was found to have been infiltrated from the cesspit of a neighboring house. Snow's map did more than identify the source of infection, it firmly embedded the spread of the disease in London's dense build fabric. Next, please. Rookeries were dense slums in which dire poverty was associated with an abandonment of social norms. Reverend Thomas Beams described St. Giles Rookery as, and I quote, worst sink of iniquity, built like a honeycomb, perforated by a number of courts and blind alleys without any outlet other than the entrance, end of quote. Friedrich Engels' harrowing description of the same quarters focused on the squalor of St. Giles, and I quote, filth and tottering ruins surpass all description, heaps of garbage and ashes lie in all directions, and the foul liquids emptied before the doors gather in stinking pools. Typically for his time, Engels associated physical decrepitude with a sense of moral decay, and I quote again, those who have not yet sunk in the whirlpool of moral ruin which surrounds them are sinking daily deeper, losing more and more of their power to resist the demoralizing influence of want, filth, and evil surroundings. The Victorian association between poverty, contagion, and immorality was localized in Charles Booth's maps of London in which the black slums were a shorthand for what he called vicious semi-criminal classes. The Booth maps articulated what Robin Evans called a moral geography of London, in which slums doubled up as infectious foci for cholera and criminality alike. The maps revealed the distribution of wealth shown in gold in the West, determined among other considerations by the direction of predominant winds. Thus, concentration of capital, clean air, and moral respectability were the prerogative of the rich West, while pollution and disease congregated in working class areas and the industrial East. 
And thus he might have well stayed, were it not for the cholera outbreaks that shifted public opinion and triggered political action, notably in the form of public health acts in 1848 and 1875. Next, please. The Peabody Trust, which was set up by US businessman George Peabody, was London's largest working class housing provider in the 19th century. The Peabody estate in Islington was the first and the prototype for 18 others designed by in-house architect Henry Astley Derbyshire. The large site, reclaimed to slum clearance, allowed the imposition of an ideal geometric form derived from the urban typology of the square. The Peabody estate stood out from the labyrinthine fabric of slums and dense speculative terraces through a rationalized layout of standardized blocks. Unlike the prosperous 18th century London squares, the Peabody ones were open at the corners, allowing the natural ventilation of the quadrangle. This characteristic layout was equivalent to a social distancing of architectural volumes. Essentially, the estate worked as a gated community surrounded by railings locked up at night. Its physical isolation was doubled up by a sense of moral distancing. Peabody residents had to prove a regular income and adhere to strict norms of behavior and hygiene under the control of superintendents. The continuous row of shorter blocks that can be seen to the south of the square on the left was added in the early 1870s as increased demand led to the size densification. Here, Darbyshire supplanted um, with this compact typology, the earlier longer model, uh, which had been organized as a corridor plan. Next, please. The modified version of the Peabody standard block, first used at Blackfriars Estate and applied thereafter, was adapted from Henry Roberts' model houses of 20 years before. As Evans wrote, Roberts' housing prototype was based on a new vision of quote unquote, introverted domesticity. The interactions of compartmentalized nuclear families were minimized through the reduction of common circulations. Thus the semi-external staircases explicitly served a hygienic purpose, natural ventilation and efficient quarantine conditions, as well as an implicit moral one, uh, the creation of a public neutral buffer zone between dwellings, reducing the potential of dubious encounters. The private laver lavatories were a bold departure from the usual common cesspit, which had proven an important source of disease. As you can see from the plans, the Peabody trustees opted instead for so-called associated dwellings with external latrines that could be regularly inspected and cleaned. In the Islington plan, these were situated at the extremities away from the naturally ventilated stairs in the middle. The residents complained about the long dark corridors, though they were more concerned with drafts and cold than with awkward social encounters. In the compact blocks, first used at Blackfriars, five dwellings on each floor opened up to a central naturally ventilated core where both the stairs and communal bathrooms were located. These compact plans also proved more efficient at an urban scale, allowing the blocks more flexible distribution in nooks and crannies of less regular sites. Next, please. I conclude with the Boundary Street Estate, the first and exemplary incursion of the London County Council into housing, which represent what the historian John Nelson Tan called the maturing of municipal responsibility. A progressive urban model, this landmark estate replaced the infamous Yago slum that you can see with a radial layout signaling a new dignified urban and social order. Designed in the ideological framework of a late Victorian socialism, the state embodied a new deference for the laboring classes and their craft. Having claimed thousands of lives across the social spectrum, Victorian London's cholera crisis created a political momentum for far-reaching urban reform. Over some 50 years, it led to the adoption of building norms, metropolitan programs of slum clearance, and new types of working class housing. Epidemiological findings from the cholera outbreaks led not only to the update of London's sewage system, but also to the integration of air circulation strategies in urban housing. Thus the most widespread and conventional configurations of modern housing today even originate in a defensive impulse to curb the spread of disease. 
Currently, cities are responding to the parallel crisis of health and climate change with plans to implement cycle lane system, traffic free areas, and self sufficient neighborhoods with shops and walk within walkable distance. While it is too early to speculate how COVID will affect housing, it indicates a renewed push towards urban decentralization, lower residential densities, and compartmentalized living units. Uh, a relapse is indicated in the origin of the word apartment, apartare, to separate. Minimal or external common circulations or private external areas such as balconies could become compulsory in future. More than anything, however, these examples invite parallels between the laissez-faire attitude of Victorian capitalism and current neoliberalism, which has today concealed simmering social crises behind the facade of by now skeletal welfare provisions. How will we balance the accumulation of real estate versus the need for personal distancing? How will urban agglomerations be managed? The COVID crisis has laid bare the reciprocity of compassionate top-down governance and collective bottom-up responsibility. Like cholera before it, it has laid bare the hidden causalities of anything goes development, social inequality and environmental distress. It holds politicians and citizens personally accountable and demands a new maturing of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Irena. Our next speaker is Suzanne Burns, who is a historian of Japan who has uh, uh, published widely on the social history of medicine and public health in modern Japan. Her most uh, recent monograph, Kingdom of the Sick, the Hi A History of Leprosy and Japan, was published in 2019 by the University of Hawaii Press. She is currently completing a book tentatively entitled Cartographies of Care, Medicine and Public Health in 19th century Tokyo. Thank you, Mohammed. Over the course of the 19th century, Japan was struck by a series of devastating cholera epidemics. The human and social crisis that resulted occurred during a moment of political turmoil. In 1868, a political revolution led to the overthrow of the Tokugawa shogunate and the establishment of a new government. In this brief presentation, I want to explore the public health response to cholera by looking specifically at Tokyo, the largest and most populous city in Japan. My focus is on the establishment of quarantine hospitals, the most visible, controversial, and contested aspect of the government's response to cholera. Cholera first reached Edo, as Tokyo was known until 1868, in August uh, 1850. 1858. It ravaged the city for almost three months. Slide please. Contemporary estimates put the total death toll at between 50,000 and 100,000 people, or 5 to 10 percent of the city's population. The term cholera was initially written with Chinese characters for tiger and badger, reflecting the belief of some that the disease resulted from a malevolent animal spirit. And here you see that representation in a patent medicine ad from the 1880s. Next slide, please. As the death toll rose, crematoria and burial sites were quickly overwhelmed and the frightened populace sought relief through communal rituals of expiation and appeasement. Meanwhile, the samurai officials officials who administered the city did little but distribute leaflets offering dietary and other advice. After 1868, the control of cholera became a testing ground for the new government's public health policies. Tokyo was the epicenter of several epidemics. In 1882, 13% of all cases were in Tokyo. In 1886, 7% and in 1890, 5%. The city proved a fertile ground for cholera for several reasons. Slide, please. Although population had declined by about a third by 1868, it rebounded rapidly in the 1870s. Because the new central government re retained control of much land in the old warrior districts in the western part of the city, new migrants had no option but to settle in the densely populated eastern wards. Old and new slums, uh, which appear in purple uh, on my map, uh, old, and new old and new slums peppered the city. 
In these areas, the poor lived in one room apartments with shared toilets and a common well outside and often in close proximity to each other. Next slide, please. These wells were a problem. Much of the city was supplied by water from rivers west and north of the city using a, a system of canals and bamboo piping that dated back to the 17th century. While the water at its source was of good quality, it was heavily contaminated as it moved through the city. In addition, the wards east of the Sumida River relied on shallow wells that tapped into easily contaminated surface water. Uh, so if you think back to the previous map, you can see that areas of dense population and areas of poor water quality, in fact, overlap. The first test of the government's ability to control cholera came in early September 1877. After learning of an outbreak in Hong Kong, the Japanese government issued aggressive policies in preparation for what it viewed as the inevitable spread of cholera to Japan. These regulations included allowing local officials to suspend all public gathering, restrictions on the sale of fresh vegetables and fish in markets, a requirement that bodies of the dead be cremated or buried quickly without ceremony, rules for the disinfection of public toilets and wells, and regulations for the disposal of human waste. But the linchpin of the government's plan to control cholera was the creation of a two-tier system of quarantine. Doctors were required to notify local public health officials in the case of a diagnosis, and these officials then had the authority to decide whether a patient could be quarantined at home or should be removed to a quarantine hospital. The rules for at-home quarantine were elaborate. The patient needed to be isolated from the rest of the household in a private room with access to separate toilet facilities. Obviously, this was a high bar that proved difficult for most of Tokyo's working class and poor to meet. Uh, next slide, please. Kala was first reported in Tokyo in mid-September, by which time six quarantine hospitals were in place around the city, and the hospitals are marked by the Red Cross. In the end, however, there were only 693 cases of the disease, so the number of people who actually experienced a quarantine hospital was very limited. Nonetheless, quarantine hospitals quickly became the object of growing popular outrage. There were reports of family members breaking into hospitals to seize their ailing relative, and of patients attempting to flee from windows. Those who lived in the vicinity of the hospitals flooded city authorities with complaints arguing that the institutions threatened their health and economic well-being. In one frightening aspect of violence, a quarantine hospital was firebombed, apparently by a disgruntled neighbor. Why the hostile reaction to these institutions designed, after all, to safeguard the city's residents? In this period, the hospital itself was a new institution, and the sick were usually cared for at home by family members. It was rumored that those confined in the quarantine hospitals were neglected and left to die, leading some to call them death hospitals, shibioin, a play on the word for quarantine hospitals, hibioin. But the location of the hospitals also contribute to resistance to quarantine. Land rights in Tokyo at this time were very complex and the authorities had no legal right to expropriate land. As a result, quarantine hospitals were established on sites under the control of, cities of city officials, and these included prison grounds and the grounds of police hospitals, where forensic autopsies were carried out and suspected criminals were cared for. Next slide. So this is just a detail of a map showing the site of the Tokyo prison, which was where the, one of the earliest and largest quarantine hospitals was established. So quarantine hospitals came to carry the taint of criminality, stoking outrage that the sick were being treated as criminals rather than as innocent victims of a disease. Quarantine hospitals were by design temporary facilities, and with the end of an epidemic, they were burned to the ground. This meant that with each subsequent epidemic, Tokyo authorities were able to experiment with the siting of quarantine hospitals. Next slide, please. In 1879, when cholera returned to Tokyo, 
quarantine hospitals were established again, but this time on the perimeter of the city. Well, this lessened the number of complaints from uh, city residents living in, in close proximity to the hospitals. The transport of patients from the densely populated center part of the city to the hospitals proved difficult in this era before public transportation. And the sight of the sick being carried through the city streets provoked panic and anxiety. Beginning with the 1882 epidemic, the government ordered that rates of infection and disease should be tracked at the level of the ward, making it possible for the first time to visualize which parts of the city were most heavily infected and the relationship between these hot spots and the quarantine hospitals. Next slide, please. As tracking rates of disease by, by ward began, quarantine hospitals were established in areas where there are high rates of infection. And you can see uh, on both of my maps, the correlation between prevalence and the siting of the hospitals. But this decision required officials again to make use of the grounds of police hospitals in the densely populated parts of the city, reigniting the tensions of the 1877 epidemic. To avoid removal to a quarantine hospital, some residents of Tokyo simply refrained from seeking medical care by a doctor, and that meant that they were free from the surveillance of the public health authorities. This led Tokyo officials to castigate the poor residents of the city, with one proclaiming that their selfish refusal to submit to quarantine threatened the very survival of the nation. Such rhetoric aside, public health officials gradually abandoned the idea of establishing autonomous temporary quarantine facilities. In 1889, as another cholera epidemic began, uh, next slide please, the Tokyo government created a system of public hospitals that contained quarantine wards. The rules for quarantine did not change, but the separation of quarantine facilities from sites associated with the police and the penal system gradually helped change the perception of quarantine into a benign practice. What then are the implications of this study of cholera in Tokyo for the COVID-19 pandemic? For one, it reveals how both epidemic disease itself and public health responses to it make visible the social, economic, and material in inequities that often shape urban life. Poor and working class residents in Tokyo were disproportionately vulnerable to cholera because of circumstances beyond their control, but they were also disproportionately affected by the quarantine policy. I'm reminded of my own city of Chicago, where the African American community on the south side where I live has borne the brunt of the current pandemic. Secondly, the case of Tokyo compels us to think about which areas within a city are available to be appropriated and utilized in times of epi epidemic disease, and the significance and consequences of the use of these spaces. In New York City, Hart Island has been used to bury the unclaimed bodies of COVID-19 victims. The island has a long history of housing discriminated others. It has been a site of a poorhouse, a prison, and an insane asylum, and now it's under the control of the New York Department of Corrections. The use of this kind of marked space in contemporary New York, as in 1879, 1879's 70s Tokyo, uh, compels us, I think, to think carefully about the associations of specific urban sites and how their use, intentionally or not, can stigmatize the sick and the dead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, our next speaker is Nicole uh, Lalubia, who is a doctoral fellow at the Institute of Landscape and Urban Studies Department of Architecture, ETH Zurich. Through her doctoral research, she intends to produce a landscape and material history of the irrigation commons of Canton Valley in Switzerland. Thank you, Mohammed. Hello to everyone attending this online symposium. I'm delighted to be here. I'm originally from Mauritius and I'm going to be offering you some insights into its history today. Next slide, please. As we face many more months, possibly years of fighting COVID-19, I suggest we turn to the case of Mauritius 
and malaria devastated the island's population for over 100 years. Yet the island was eventually successful in vanquishing the disease. Mauritius, I believe, offers a uniquely informative history of how landscape transformation and territorial zoning, along with the representational techniques of surveying and mapping, were key to these eradication efforts. In this short presentation, I'm going to describe environmental control of the disease through lava siding and the steps that led to the elimination campaign of 1948 to 1951, during which widespread spraying of insecticides was undertaken based on climatic zoning of the island's territory. Let us situate ourselves on this map, showing the island of Mauritius, which is an area of 1800 square kilometers. It's 61 kilometers from north to south and 47 kilometers from east to west. It's situated in the Indian Ocean, 800 kilometers east of Madagascar. I'd like to call your attention to the volcanic topography of the island, which results in a high central plateau and lower coastal plains. The climate is subtropical with heavy rainfall in the center and a much drier and warmer climate on the coasts. Mauritius has no native inhabitants and was consecutively colonized by the Dutch, the French and the British. Malaria was probably brought to the island on slave ships from Southern Africa. In 1865, the initial malaria outbreak killed 12% of the island's population. Next slide, please. In 1897, the British medical doctor and Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Dr. Ronald Ross, discovered the cause of malaria. He found that it was transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. We now know that the mosquito acts as a vector for a plasmodium parasite, which unlike bacteria and viruses cannot survive outside a living host. In 1907, Dr. Ross visited Mauritius to lead an entomological survey. His main recommendation was to establish environmental control over the disease, primarily through the drainage of marshes and bush clearing to destroy mosquito breeding places. Next slide, please. One such breeding site was Clairefonds, where Ross and his team of moustiquiers tracked the behavior of the mosquitoes in relation to the natural and built environment and characterize their habitual movements in space, including their usual travel distances and thus the scale of interventions that might be needed to intercept them. Next slide, please. This plan acts as a record of the survey of 119 houses and puts forth a spatial argument that houses closest to the marsh were affected first, that symptoms of fever were most severe in locations closest to the marshes, and that the nearer a house is to the marsh, the earlier its inhabitants become sick. The study led to the drainage of the Clairefort marshes and the destruction of this ecosystem. Understanding mosquito habitat preferences revealed itself to be a tricky target. Some mosquitoes seemed to prefer shaded wooded areas, while others quite stubbornly persecuted the inmates of houses, as Dr. Ross put it. Next slide, please. Some empirical research also showed that mosquitoes favor water covered in algae, which necessitates sunlight to grow. This led the director of forests to recommend the reforestation of so-called river reserves, 10 to 50 feet wide belts along watercourses where the government could regulate vegetational cover even when located on private property. Many of these rivers were located on sugarcane estates, the expansion of which caused extensive deforestation. Although the relation was not understood at the time, the first outbreak of malaria coincided with the establishment of a sugarcane monoculture on the island. This major shift in land use created the environmental conditions that allowed malaria to spread. Next slide, please. Mosquito behavior remained confounding until entomologist Malcolm McGregor made a major discovery. Multiple mosquito species were spreading malaria. This led to intense research in the 1920s and 30s into the habits and habitats of Anopheles funestus and Anopheles gambiae. Extensive surveys of breeding sites were produced as part of an island-wide project of lava siding. Next slide, please. For instance, a minute analysis of the temperatures, salinity, salinity levels, and water flow through these abandoned salt pans led to their rehabilitation through small interventions in the form of stonework, the opening of channels to the sea, the addition of sand, and promoting the growth of different grass species. Next slide. 
At a different scale, a survey of the eastern region named FLAC recorded some 30,000 patches of water on 15 meter intervals, each location numbered and physically recorded. Next slide. The painstaking efforts put into lava siding meant that by 1948, the capital and center of business, Paul Louis, as well as the residential central plateau were close to being malaria free. However, malaria was still a threat in the coastal plains. Many inhabitants had moved to the towns of Kyupi, Vakwa and Katrogon on the high plateau. As a result, less fortunate Indo-Mauritians originally brought to the island as indentured laborers had thus acquired property in the less desirable lowlands. This differentiation of wealth, class, and ethnicity was further intensified by the climatic McGregor Line, an altitudinal line at approximately 1,000 feet above sea level, separating the hot coastal areas from the cool central plateau. The line was directly implemented through the spraying of insecticide. Deed launch in 1948, the malaria control scheme sent a large nationwide team to conduct indoor spraying for the following three years on a seasonal basis. The map on the left shows the unsprayed central zone, referring to the wealthier area within the cooler climatic zone. Even in the spray zones, houses with painted walls, a sign of wealth, would receive special treatment. In order to avoid staining of the walls, the usual DDT wettable powder would be replaced with the less destructive DDT solution in kerosene. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, modest homes were subject to repeated insecticide spraying. The traditional construction techniques and local customs irritated the head of the spraying scheme, Dr. Dowling. He writes, it has long been the custom in Mauritius for the walls and floors of houses in the coastal districts to be replastered with fresh mud and dung mixture during December in preparation for the New Year festivities. This custom is a long established one. And in spite of the repeated requests by our staff, the population continued to cover up the surface deposit of insecticide with fresh plaster." End of quote. Such practices undermined the work of Dr. Darling's spraying teams, who also faced the challenge of homes that were locked while entire families worked the fields during the sugarcane harvest. On the whole though, it was reported that only three households were prosecuted for refusal to allow entry during the spraying campaign. By 1952, Anopheles funestus was considered eradicated through spraying, while Anopheles gambier was being controlled through lava siding. And in the 1960s, malaria efforts switched to surveillance and treatment of imported cases. The last indigenous case of malaria was found in 1965, a remarkable achievement in public health. In conclusion, malaria eradication in Mauritius relied heavily on landscape and territorial strategies, environmental surveying and mapping at various scales. Let me reflect on these strategies in relation to the current COVID-19 pandemic. In Mauritius, land use change through the replacement of indigenous forests by sugarcane monoculture, altered the island's ecology and produced new favorable habitats for mosquitoes. Today, global land use change and more specifically the exploitation of fertile soils for agriculture has led to massive destruction of wildlife habitats. This is one of the causes of the emergence of COVID-19 through cross-species transmission. While non-human species present risks as sources of pathogens, they also hold the key to many potential treatments. This makes the protection of wildlife habitats through careful land use planning imperative. Finally, climatic zoning in Mauritius allowed the authorities to penetrate the domestic space and enforce the application of toxic substances in the home. This radical and intrusive act was successful in nearly completely eradicating malaria. Yet it also solidified the conception of safe and unsafe, desirable and undesirable zones on the island. The case of Mauritius should alert us to the potential of exacerbating socioeconomic inequalities through such territorial zoning. Global climate change is likely to accelerate the creation of so-called desirable zones with rapid and mass migrations of population. We've already observed vast, vast migrations of the working poor in India. In the Western Hemisphere, we've seen the wealthy abandon the city for their secluded second homes. Such movements of population, especially if they become permanent, 
may call for the renegotiation of the socioeconomic contract between global cities and hinterlands, a proposition that is laden with potentially conflictual, but also beneficial prospects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicole. Before we begin our Q&A, and we look forward to addressing many of the important and timely questions you have collectively raised yesterday and today, we wanted to share a few observations and questions and amplify points raised over these two days and share some provocations for future practice. We will begin with the micro level observations reflecting on, on insights from the 18, uh, 18 presentations compri comprising this symposium, then open up our reflections to a macro level view of implications and how this symposium provokes new practices. Thank you. So I have the, the, the daunting task right now of um, really trying to distill out some of the, some of the implications that we have um, learned from the, the case studies that we've seen over the last two days. Um, so let me begin by amplifying um, a thread that joins together nearly all of our presentations, which is um, that epidemics exploit and amplify social inequality. Um, so we've seen how regulations of quarantine, self-isolation, social distancing, and many other um, interventions and the experience and impact of these. Um, we see how we share these with um, many of the people who populated the case studies that we have seen so far. Um, we have that in common. Yet we also reminded that these practices and experiences um, and even the incidence of disease itself were uneven across urban landscapes and communities due to nuances of racism and segregation. And even as Joshua mentioned, um, in the case of Prague, even just to the politics of neglect and indifference. So I think it's helpful for us to be reminded um, that othering and fear, um, unfortunately, accompany these pandemic responses. And this isn't just something that happens at a social level, but we can also see how this translates into mental maps of space or kind of collective understandings about spaces um, and, and urban zones. Um, we saw really good examples of this um, by Desiree and Nicole and Fezanor thinking about um, prisoners of war and um, different regions of Mauritius and, um, and Galata and how these different places and spaces and practices and peoples have been imbued with um, positive and or ultimately negative connotations um, in conceiving of the disease. So I think this is helpful in, in helping us echo um, and reflect on a question that was posed in yesterday's Q and A session, which is how we might better intervene with these ideas in mind, right? How do we really understand the other and how we can better take care of everyone and each other um, to cooperate, to put it in Joshua's terms um, during these epidemics. So second, epidemics shape the location, instrument and aims of local and national governments. This has been a really big insight that we explored not only today, but also we've seen certainly the role of local governments and today's case studies as well. Pandemics necessarily make major impacts on politics. Um, and as we saw in Mehreen's presentation yesterday of Mughal India, it has forced um, governments to change or to move. Also, there's opportunities to perform one's own power or presence or efficacy or aims. And so really a lot of this is really imbued with symbolism um, as we think about the role that governments can play in rethinking the form and function of, of various urban interventions. I'm thinking here of the case of um, Naples from Sophia yesterday. Um, so the this, this symbolic is incredibly important here, but also pragmatics play a big role too. Um, and especially at the, at the local scale, this really is where meaningful interventions happen first. I'm thinking here of the examples of York from Anne-Marie and Kathleen yesterday thinking about um, Eastern Europe. Um, we also have seen um, kind of echoes of how of how does this change come about um, and, and one one thing we wanted to amplify is that media is a tool to not only inform the public, but also to inform um, government's um, actions. Um, and so this is something that we're going to be talking about a bit more and in, in a moment Mohammed's going to talk about this being a primary aim of our of, our, of convening this symposium really thinking about how do we how do we educate the public and also how do we um, really work towards substantive change. Um, more broadly. A briefly stated, epidemics, um, as we can certainly see today, but also in these case studies, raise new challenges for occupational health, um, especially among 
um, the working class and front lines workers. This is something that Emily raised in thinking about um, her case study in Bombay. Epidemics um, shape social practices. Um, and of course, if we've seen many of these then in turn become social policies and built forms. So um, a nice example of this is thinking about social distancing. And as Irina showed us in London housing, um, this is kind of codified into built practices. How, are, how, are, how is housing reconsidered um, to codify some of these, um, these social practices? And of course, then these, these reforms echo long into the future. And, and shape the way that we navigate and inhabit spaces. Um, also, we've seen how, how uh, practices in life and also in death are shaped um, necessarily by these, by these epidemics and, and pandemics. Um, Stefan's case in Cairo was helpful in us in illustrating that we're not only thinking about what does social life look like among the living, but also among funerary practices and how does that shape um, how bodies are, are conceived of and um, and treated um, upon death. So there's some bigger observations here, uh, which is the value of, of us looking at these multiple urban interventions and contexts and traditions um, as a way to have a robust wide angle lens for us to view not only our current situation, but hopefully for us to think about um, what reforms make sense, what interventions make sense. Um, I think the, the widest angle lens possible that we can use right now will be instructive to that end. We've seen that epidemics affect and of course are affected by regional and international commerce and trade. Um, and really we've, we've seen how, how these pandemics, these illnesses were transmitted along um, regional and international commerce and trade routes. So Kathleen's example yesterday was really helpful in mapping out um, the, the overlay of these two. But movement more broadly has been a theme that really has been echoed throughout these case studies. Movement not only just as a cause, but also as a response to um, the outbreak of epidemic illnesses, whether that's people fleeing to second homes or whether that's um, necessitated movement or enforced movement of, of bodies. Um, movement plays a key role here. And so we might be uh, it might be instructive for us to think about these flows um, through space, not just thinking about the, the institutions or the interventions that are mapped onto our space, um, but in fact, how do people move throughout these, um, both before, during, and after um, epidemic outbreak. Epidemics, um, as we have seen, affect built forms at many scales. So we've seen this from housing to, um, to hospitals, to zoning efforts, um, and, and everything in between. Um, and of course, Nic and Nicole's presentation made me reflect on the fact that as we're thinking about urban environments, that really is the focus of our presentation today. We don't wanna forget the impact of pandemics on natural environments. So both Desiree's and, and Nicole's cases today reminded us um, of the importance of thinking about um, our natural environment. And also more broadly, we might think about how climate change is going to make us increasingly vulnerable to these epidemic illnesses and how might we be better prepared um, and think about this um, in our interventions. So a bigger observation here is that um, while we await, um, anticipate, and even advocate potential changes in cities and architectural design in this post-COVID or even current COVID era, our case studies remind us that um, the design and use of infrastructure, urban design practices, architecture is really only one part of this picture. Um, in fact, we need to pay careful attention to the social life of these interventions as well, by which I mean their use, their experience, their meaning, um, their negotiation um, between and among people. Um, oftentimes resistance is part of this as we saw in Susan's case study in Tokyo and also Ruth's case study um, in Spain yesterday. Um, and these are also sites of negotiation. Um, Andrew's case in Bristol also reminded us of this fact too. Um, so again, we don't wanna just think about these as kind of static built forms, but really what is their use? What is their meaning? And, and how are they being used or even resisted in these different cases? And how does that help us understand the interventions that are currently being planned or, um, or built um, in, our, in our current COVID era? And finally, um, a related point is that epidemics necess necess necessitate and spur major planning projects. Um, so we've seen many examples of how pandemics have led to these major design and planning projects um, from hospitals in Lisbon, um, and we've also seen cases in Naples and Bristol and Cairo. So these far flung geographies um, have reminded us of the value of really thinking big in terms of these architectural and urban investments and projects. Um, but this, of course, requires political will, uh, which I know is increasingly challenging. We've talked a lot about the role of neoliberalism and also 
um, you know, current, um, current austerity and how does this challenge the need to really make these large investments. Um, but these investments are great in the service of um, public health. They can be good, they can be benevolent, um, but I think as our case studies have shown us today, and I was really reminded of this in our, in our presentations today, that often this will, um, to the kind of the will that accompanies these large projects can be good, but it can also be more ambivalent in really thinking about the, the, the greater symbolic or social or political aims that are, that are met or that accompany um, these interventions into public health. Um, again, Sophia's example in Naples, I think Susan's examples in Tokyo um, and Fadiba's examples in, um, in Istanbul are helping us to see how also these interventions can be instruments of control and surveillance, punishment, or even appropriation. So we would be well, well advised to, um, to take a critical eye, um, not only to historical examples, but, but in particular to our, our present day context as well. On a much more positive note, I just wanted to end my, uh, my observations or conclusions um, by thinking more positively about the, the productive power of these big, large-scale urban interventions. Um, Carlo's presentation um, and exploration of Ingracia um, in Italy was reminded me that, our, that, our, that the goal really is not as productive if we're thinking about a new normal, right, that kind of perpetuate this state of emergency. Um, but rather to think about how might we use this opportunity, these big projects that we might envision um, to design a better living condition for everyone. And I think that that's a, that's a beautiful um, takeaway here for us um, is, to, is to really think big, to think about these major infrastructural changes that aren't only just in response to right now to disease mitigation, um, but maybe to help us think about and inhabit a much better life for everyone. Thank you, Caitlin. These observations based on the studies uh, presented by speakers lead to inspire and provoke more fundamental reflections on our role and shared responsibilities in the COVID and post COVID age. So the case studies that we have discussed in the last two days confirm that despite our technological advances, human beings are not much different in, de in dealing with COVID crisis versus pandemics in the medieval and early modern world. The principles are the same. The case studies prove how crucial it is to read history. They also confirm the marginalization of humanities, including history in academia and the real world has not helped the situation as historians had already warned us about pandemics way before this crisis. So the goal is to make parallels between the past and present and to challenge our notion of history. History is not about the past, but also the present and future. And our responsibility is not necessarily to answer questions, but to raise new ones, define new frameworks, to encourage comparative studies on pandemics uh, across geographies, have a forward looking vision in the study of the built environment, and again, to stay relevant. Studies, scholars of any kind, especially experts in humanities, uh, architecture, anthropology, sociology, art, science, history, should be engaged in the discourse of pandemics. We should go beyond the boundaries of our fields and the academic world in general. This is a unique opportunity to broaden our audience, stay dynamic and uh, proactive by publishing in newspapers and interviewing with media outlets, get engaged with our communities and make an impact on the public. This is not the right time to stay passive. We are still living in the crisis and our goal is not to present any solutions. Instead, we aim to highlight the nuances and complexities of the relationship between societies and pandemics, especially in in, in the post-crisis uh, era. The pandemics have presented us as scholars and practitioners, a unique opportunity to collaborate across disciplines and continents, to go beyond our conventional platforms for knowledge sharing and dissemination, to be more innovative and affect decision-making processes in public health, architecture, design, urban planning, education, and even politics.
Now it's time for q and I will invite our panelists to unmute their videos and our attendees to uh, submit questions if they haven't done so already. Uh, right now, uh, we dedicate this time to you. Uh, we will now respond to your questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible before our session ends. I wanna emphasize that we are scheduling interviews with major scholars from different fields to be posted on our YouTube page and will pursue a publication based on this topic. So rest assured that if you, that your questions would be extremely helpful in shaping the next stages of this project or initiative, even if we don't get a chance to address all of them today. Okay, thank you so much. I actually wanted to start with um, a question that was posed for Joshua Teplitsky who talked about the Jewish ghetto in Prague um, and Fezenor, uh, this came from you. Um, so your question was about um, if, if Josh also looked at Czech sources and if they would differ from, um, from German or the sources he came across in Prague and to um, I mean, German sources and I mean, if so, to what extent um, were they different and kind of um, how were they different? This question made me think more broadly about the question of, I'm curious if thinking about epidemics as a site of often contentious practices, if any of you came across in your archival sources, um, evidence of kind of these negotiations, um, or were there kind of differences in these sources and how did you navigate or understand them? Um, does anyone want, do any of our panelists want to want to take on that question? Marine, I see you first and then Fezenor will we'll do you next. Just a kind of minor um, response that I can make to that is that when um, going through the uh, local source that I looked at, the Jahangir Name, and then looking at some of the European sources and their descriptions of the numbers of dead who were occurring during the plague, um, we've got references to, you know, 100 people a day dying in Agra. Um, from the Jahangir Name, but um, for example, Sir Thomas Rowe, who was the um, ambassador from the court of James I um, of England to uh, Jahangir's court, in his memoirs, he writes that a thousand people a day are dying between the reported number of deaths which are occurring. And um, I think we can put that down to various exaggerations which were made on uh, the part of the Europeans who are at the court, but also, you know, Jahangir probably wanting to downplay the number of dead who are, um, you know, occurring uh, on a daily basis in Agra as well, so that the plague doesn't appear as severe in the Mughal sources itself. Thank you. And Fezanur, I saw your hand too. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the Ottoman sources do narrate a very different let's say not very different, but a different story from the European sources, I would say, you know, the conceptualization of plague um, among the Muslims was very different compared to the um, European or let's say Christian and Jewish um, narratives. So this led to um, different narratives indeed in different languages. Um, I could say that, for example, in Turkish sources, you will see a more poetic um, conceptualization of plague more poetic um, narratives around it. And let's say um, people would not even want to utter the word of plague even. So, so it was a taboo term and this um, it's been a taboo definitely changed um, the narratives around it and how they would um, go about with the disease, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Any last thoughts here from our panelists? I see Carlo, yes. Um, yes, um, referring to the comment made by Fezanur, uh, I would like to stress that uh, Ingracia and other Sicilian sources talk about the difference between the, the Muslim and Christian concept of the plague. And uh, given that the, the outbreak of Palermo uh, that I talked about in 1576 was caused by the trade between um, and the two sides of the Mediterranean just five years after the, the Battle of Lepanto. Um, it, in, in the sources about um, uh, 
the discussion of pl uh, plague related topics on the Muslim world, the Christians or Ingrassi at least says that uh, it was not cured as it was seen. This is the perception of uh, European scholars of the uh, Muslim concept of uh, plague, uh, that it was seen just as a divine scourge and that it was not cured. So uh, that is uh, quite different in the perception that Euro Europeans or at least Sicilians had of a plug in um, in the other side of the Mediterranean. So there was this uh, different concept that was uh, um, deployed by scientists back then, just to continue on the topic. Thank you. And we have got maybe, um, I see Asaf Fariba's hand and then maybe Irina, and then we can move on to another, um, another question. So Fariba. Oops, hold on. I've got to unmute you. Let's see. I can't. See. Oh, there we go. There you go. You you should be good now. Well, I I just wanted to kind of um, encourage us to be a bit careful about this kind of divide, cultural divide, and perceptions of the plague. I tried to highlight that in my paper. One thing that I observed from looking, I mean, and the problem with, with the Ottoman Empire is the absence of sources from the Muslim side. You know, they're they're there, um, and we have to discover them. We haven't discovered them yet. But one court case was really interesting. So someone brought um, a case to the court, the body of a son, claiming that his son had been murdered. Um, in the court, there was a physician who was present. This is from the 16th century. They examined the body and they pointed out, you know, to the buboes in the body, you know, and then the doctor immediately said, no, your son died from the buboes, you know, not from, uh, from an assault, an injury. So he is a victim of the plague, which really kind of shows early in the 16th century, and we are not even talking about 18th and 19th centuries, you know, a very scientific rational approach, right, to death, you know, the examination, the physical examination of the body, right, and the recording, you know, in, in the court documents that so-and-so died from the buboes. He or she was brought in, you know, and, uh, you, know, so, you know, so what does that mean, right? So can we categorically say that in the Islamic world, the plague was seen, you know, as, as a punishment from God, right? And, and in the West, it was different. So I really want us to be, because I think, you know, these perceptions are everywhere. We cannot really say, you know, this part of the Mediterranean is thinking more rationally and the other side isn't. Um, I just wanted to kind of add that in. Thank you. And final thoughts from Irina? Uh, it's just a small point. The question, of course, does not apply at all to London that has English sources and I do not have the, 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 the opportunity of comparing different languages. Um, what I did have was the opportunity of comparing different sources. So it's very difficult when you consult medical uh, journals, when you consult um, public uh, newspaper, gazettes, articles, and, and uh, professional papers delivered by architectural experts when, when the, uh, the housing expertise becomes, becomes an issue. So uh, sometimes the architects, arch architects uh, lectures are extremely revealing of social attitudes, uh, the way that architects were speaking in the 1860s and 1870s about the inhabitants of the, of the reformed housing was extremely patronizing. Um, and uh, this changed already in the 1890s changed considerably. Uh, with this, with this introduction of socialist ideals. Uh, apart from that, I just wanted to point out uh, the comment by Atia Kidbai in the Q and A. Uh, she she makes a very interesting point that it would be interesting to parallel this this uh, this uh, case study of London with actually what happens in the colonies, from where, of course, the cholera originated in the first place. Thank you, Irina. We do have a question that was also raised yesterday and we intentionally kept it for today. And that has to do with your kind of perception or your predictions of future and how the current pandemics is gonna make it, is gonna impact the, the urban planning projects, especially when it comes to the public spaces or the affordable housing. And I know that Irina and several other speakers addressed that, but. I, I mean, if uh, especially Stefan or Irina, if you have any any kind of predictions or any um, any response, that would be great. 
Stefan, do you want to start or? I, I don't have any prediction, to be honest, so <laughs> I have nothing, nothing to add. Uh, I came across um, an article in The Guardian just last week that was addressing exactly this question. And um, of course, here you have a, a, a juxtaposition of um, slightly older concerns with climate change uh, with the very fresh concerns of what COVID means. and. Um, uh, the the measures that I mentioned already, you know, the introduction of uh, of, of uh, cycling lanes or these uh, semi-autonomous zones in which one can work to work and and you know you don't have to take public transport to, to get to the major foci of one's everyday life. Um, but also, somebody um, I, I'm. I, I, I've been in the US a few times, but uh, when a friend of mine said, oh yes, New York, the city without balconies, uh, I was quite surprised. I never thought that actually typologically balconies are not something that uh, I used in very much uh, or encountered very much. And uh, in, con in contrast to Europe where balcony is a very, very uh, powerful presence, and that has come very clearly to light, particularly in the last few weeks and months. But um, there is this, um, the, the Viral Balconies project by, by the chair of Toma Vermate at the Zurich uh, that looks exactly at, at this phenomenon of how the balcony is now being used in, in these times. So that led me to speculate on whether the balcony might become even a normative zone, uh, a normative uh, addition to, to, the, to the dwelling, just like, uh, an internal bathroom is nowadays. And it's, it's quite interesting that these days we hear a lot about that the efficiency and productivity of hospitals or kind of small healthcare facilities, as, at least in the context of, of the US. And I, I mean, I, I found uh, Daniel's project fascinating that the whole hospital had, I mean, design had to do with, with, with pandemics and how hospitals were being seen as part of this um, urban infrastructure. So what's your, uh, I mean, how do you see this change in future? How do you think our notion of hospital design or healthcare design, Daniel, may change as a result of this, um, this the, 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 the epidemics? It's hard to, to predict, I guess, um, but from what I've read, a lot of um, architects are already considering um, more technological interventions, I guess, in terms of like um, smart elevators or, you know, easily um, or smart doors, I guess. Um, but in terms of how architecture and public health are going to come together, I haven't, I've looked, but I haven't read anything that sort of has a, a greater plan for, for how these, um, these two are gonna, um, are going to collaborate. These two fields are going to collaborate, but of course, it it seems like a, a no brainer. I, I I think we all hope that the new I mean the the social distancing doesn't become the new norm in our societies. That's our hope. Sophia, you wanted to address this issue as well. Um, only to add that I read an article by Oliver Wainwright at the Guardian, which I think comments on this very well. It's speculative about how architecture might change. But he um, talks about a hands-free future in buildings, so moving through spaces without interaction with the actual building and the way that staircases might be planned to reduce person-to-person -person interaction, which I suppose would be a real shame. I think... Me, also, oh, do you have one more comment, Fariba? You got to uh, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I was going to um, to kind of add that I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether, you know, in the 18th century Istanbul, uh, the kind of, you know, creation of all these public and private parks had anything to do with this concept that, you know, ventilation, fresh air um, is good for, for your health. Um, and of course, you know, the rich could afford it. You see the same thing in London. Uh, you know, the adoption of gardens, you know, public parks, private parks all over the city 
uh, you see this in Iran and, you know, in, um, in Mughal India. And I think whether we should, you know, really kind of link the dots um, and where does this movement start and originate? I know that uh, Mohammed works on gardens. So I would like to kind of hear his feedback, you know, on this question, because I know, you know, he's really interested on this, whether gardens have anything to do with health. Mohammed, do you want to do you want to respond, or do you want um, to move on to the next question? Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's quite interesting that you are raising this question, and uh, and in in the in the last slide we were trying to say that it's really important to stay relevant, and it amazes me as a historian of Islamic architecture how much we have ignored certain issues such as health or even pandemics when it comes to uh, uh, the, the, the study of landscapes and gardens and even architecture in the Islamic world. And uh, as a historian of, again, Persian gardens and landscapes, that was completely out of my radar. So I'm, I'm making a big confession today. So I want to move us on to another question, still thinking about implications. We had a question here about, you know, we're thinking about where if we envision futures in which we have to be more socially distanced as spatial practice, um, what are some um, economic implications that we might foresee? So I wanted to open that question more broadly, just to think about um, how you all are conceiving of um, potential economic effects of exactly what this question is asking, or even as we maybe start thinking about landscapes, right, that are imbued with these different meanings, kind of the healthy versus not, um, what, what implications, good, bad, or otherwise, um, does anyone want to amplify? Andrew, I'm wondering if you in particular have something you want to share here, since yours is one of the cases that, that, that thought about economic implications. Um, well, I don't really have anything uh, immediately intelligent to offer. I mean, I can certainly talk a little bit about uh, about the way in which the the uh, gardens and air and spaces and things like that functioned in in concepts of health in in seventeenth and eighteenth century Bristol, and the effect that that had on the economy. Because, of course, as I mentioned, lots of goods were being left just outside the city in order to air. So the circulation of the air had a disinfectant property um, in, in order to, to get rid of miasma. But in terms of in terms of predictions for today, I'm afraid I'm not brave enough to uh, to venture a, an opinion on that. But thanks for the invitation. Fair point. I know it's a challenging question as we as we think about what's what's next, right? We it's it's hard not to want to be um, prescriptive here since so much of this is still unfolding. We don't know what's coming next. Does anyone else have any thoughts about economic implications? Emily. Yeah, um, mine's not going to be prescriptive, hopefully, uh, but more just to highlight that one of the things we're seeing, especially in the US, is a shift in um, the economic importance of certain occupations. So the fact that one in four Americans uh, of who are uh, working age are unemployed right now, um, and that those unemployed are really coming from what were considered to be like high-skilled jobs uh, in um, in kind of powerful positions and that who we're relying on for the most part are people who are largely classified as wage workers. And so that's leading some to questions about uh, the economic value of particular positions and whether they're being um, kind of monetarily compensated in the right way. And uh, yeah, and so that's kind of an interesting, an interesting thing that's happening that I think we've seen some historical trends with thinking about, you know, kind of occupational hazards in Bombay, for example, um, being largely confined to wage workers as well. Um, it's a trend that I'm not sure, but I'm not really sure what's going to happen with it. So much as it's just interesting that that's kind of an echo. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we have a question from Marcus about uh, sustainable architecture and, and the fact that uh, how do you think the pandemics is going to make an impact on uh, this movement that we already had in, in, our, in our building design, architectural design, and urban planning towards uh, designing cities that are more sustainable. I know that Nicole kind of addressed these environmental issues that are quite ignored in the discussion of pandemics because we are just so focused on our urban societies that we completely 
uh, neglect the, the environment and what's going to happen to the environment in the post-COVID age. So I want to ask uh, 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 Nicole if, if she has any, any observations on, on this. And, and after that, maybe Suzanne, if, if she has any observations on, uh, on Japan. Um, I would say just reiterating the, the kind of concluding points that I made that I would rather than thinking of sustainable architecture in terms of, you know, a sustainable building, I think we first need to think on this global scale of land use because um, the kind of, you know, rapid consumption of land is a, a core issue and um, that really ties kind of this, this entanglement of issues that we need to address. And then beyond that, if we think of kind of green architecture, sustainable architecture, beyond all of the um, flashy marketing that goes with it, I think what it really comes down to is just good um, living conditions for people. And I think, you know, we've seen architects already kind of responding to all these calls, as Irina was mentioning, for balconies, et cetera, and kind of pushing back on a lot of the, the kind of the forces from the market that have pushed towards micro apartments, um, spaces with really poor conditions of living. And I think if we just focus on um, offering people good living spaces with air, with sunlight, um, that's going to be a major step forward already. And to me, that's kind of the basis of sustainable architecture. And, and you, are, you are absolutely correct that probably in, in architecture, we are over obsessed with, with building design, right? That we completely ignore land as the basis of any intervention. Uh, Suzanne, do you have any observations on this issue of environment and, uh, and uh, sustainability? Go ahead, please. Suzanne, we can't hear you. Yeah. Um... Thinking about this question and also the previous one about the the economic implications of, ep of epidemic, um, you know, the Tokyo case, there was a recognition very early on in the 1870s that there were uh, problems with water supply and sanitation. Um, and there were actually government did studies to figure out how much it would cost to improve the situation. And they didn't go that route. They made an economic decision that quarantine was a um, more cost efficient way of dealing with the epidemic because the government had other priorities in this period including uh, industrialization and building a military. And so I think, you know, um, in the contemporary debates about um, the current pandemic and opening the country and what it means um, for human life, there's a similar sort of equation going on and I think that's disturbing to think about um, that um, the notion it's cheaper to forcibly move people into a quarantine hospital than to deal with the long-term problem of a contaminated water supply. And I, I think as we think about um, urban design and the kinds of decisions that are being made by elected public officials, this is something to think about, you know, how do we evaluate um, the value of human life in the midst of a pandemic when there are other economic concerns in, at play. Thank you. Um, my next question is going to be about um, colonies and the colonizers and how this um, complexifies interventions. Um, so this is a this is an unformed question on my behalf. It was much better formed by um, by our by those um, who wrote in with questions about about colonies. But I'm curious if any if any of our panelists want to talk about um, colonies. Emily, I, I think I remember you mentioning this yesterday. But how can we conceive of relationships between kind of the colonizers, colonies, um, and also these in, these interventions? And were they the same? Different? Um, tinged with anything? new. Um, do you want to start us off, Emily? Sure. Uh, this actually gets right at the heart of my dissertation project, which kind of looks at the ways that infrastructures have been uh, moved, like especially sanitation and infrastructures have been moved into different landscapes um, and colonial urban spaces. And often they're kind of modeled wholesale on uh, British 
uh, sanitation patterns. So for example, in Bombay, there were plans to kind of build sewers that were based around Joseph Bazalgette's sewers uh, almost completely. Uh, but of course, then there was the question of monsoon patterns and drainage, uh, all of which were very different in Mumbai than they were in London. And also that kind of creates a space for uh, a different species of rat to come in and live in sewers, uh, which is the, the Norway rat, um, which is not actually indigenous to the area, but it's kind of moved in uh, via shipping. Um, yeah, and so you see this kind of, in, in, in that kind of short narrative, you can kind of see the ways in which um, like non-locally adapted interventions can lead to unexpected and uh, difficult consequences. And so there are these kinds of relationships between um, power, like kind of colonial powers and colonized spaces where um, in the kind of uh, clashing of infrastructure and ecology, you get positions for the emergence of epidemics, right? Um, yeah, and that's, that's something that has a legacy even today in the way that the cities are constructed and uh, in the way that epidemics emerge. Thank you. And to switch gears just slightly, Desiree, I know that um, that you talked about a different um, kind of a different context, but I, I'm seeing echoes of this question in um, how we the, your your case study of um, the U.S. treatment of prisoners of war. So I'm wondering if you had any comments here. Sure. I guess we can think of sort of U.S. empire during World War II and the way um, former uh, territories, Hawaii, Alaska, but also today we have Puerto Rico and um, other places in the Pacific and Caribbean that kind of remain in these sort of limbo legal statuses. Um, and um, for me, and thinking about prisoners of war, it's really the ocean, which has this sort of no man's kind of land almost. And I was really struck by the Navy um, ship that arrived in New York and kind of the images. And I remember thinking back to um, archival footage of these sort of Navy ships roaming um, or roving um, the Pacific waters. Um, but we can also think of that in terms of cruise ships that, that, that sort of inhabit this kind of non-place. And these are often oceanic jurisdictions that seem to take on their own kind of legal status. So not just colonies, but landscape um, that kind of moves off of like continu contiguous land masses onto um, islands, um, oceans and shores that seem to in, in wartime and emergency situations in the case of pandemics and epidemics, um, take on these new kind of roles as areas of experimentation, areas of occup occupation um, that just get enhanced um, and I was actually in Hawaii when um, COVID-19 broke out and it was surprising to see how um, kind of a, a former territory that's now a state has, um, has been able to, to sort of monitor cases, but isn't able to um, control kind of domestic travelers who are coming in from the US mainland, who still see Hawaii as a tropical destination that's far away and that's immune. Um, so also islands and travel and touristic kind of destinations and the immunity from disease uh, where people are kind of escaping to it. So all these kind of factors, um, I think for me really solidified in thinking about this colonizer colony where these places are still viewed as inhabitable places um, in spite of you know restrictions. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Desiree. I, I think that the human beings have found every single tool to, to destroy the, the earth, talking about the cruise ships, right? So we are <laughs> clever in that sense. Uh, uh, one of the questions that are raised by, by our attendees here, Atia has been talking about the, the connections between uh, England and the, the British colonies and the, the hygiene, uh, policies having to do with the, with the mainland. And we see the same thing in, for example, Mozambique, where the, the Portuguese are, are kind of implementing the same pol policies. But as a result of these pandemics in many of these uh, contexts, uh, we, we all see that the segregation is gonna get worse, right? So the, the pandemics get, I mean, make cities and urban spaces more segregated. So I, I want to ask Anne Mary and, and Kathleen if in their studies found anything that they I mean had to do with this notion of segregation and that, that the role that uh, 
the pandemics, the epidemics played in, in their cases. Um, in the case of York, it's in a sense, it's the other way around that the susceptibility to endemic disease or epidemic disease is uh, concentrated in those low lying areas which are close to rivers and uh, are inhabited by poor people. But, um, you know, the architectural historians among us will know that Vitruvius in the first century is advising people to site their um, high quality building up high. Uh, so the people who are protected are the people in the better quality housing. And that's that's uh, that, that kind of runs through from antiquity all the way through. It's interesting, these patterns. I mean, we're talking about islands and um, the original Locus Classicus of the hospital was on an island in the middle of the Tiber in Rome. So in some respects, people's behavior is very deeply, um, it's culturally ingrained, you know, people are just doing what, what they're doing. So um, in my observation, it's not, because I haven't been looking at the development of housing subsequently, um, uh, it's that where the patterns of unappealing land are, that's where you find poor people dwelling, and that's where um, you know there's the the concentration of, of people who are susceptible is. Katali. Yeah, uh, thank you. In the cases which I looked at, it's not so much the, the spatial segregation, but rather the differentiation by wealth, which is considered in the sources. So, for instance, the pamphlet which I, I looked at by a certain Zaltzman uh, prescribes different sort of remedy to different uh, parts of the population. So if you cannot afford this kind of medicine, if you cannot afford to fumigate with some uh, very exotic incenses, then uh, you can still buy another type, a, a cheaper one, something which is generally available. So I was um, quite surprised to see how much of an awareness there was uh, to the different uh, carrying capacity of the population and offering different sorts of uh, possibilities of defense. But also there was a very self-conscious attitude that our community was saved, but all the others who didn't uh, afford or could not afford to, to invite a, an educated physician or couldn't afford to implement those measures which meant uh, the lockdown. They were just ravaged by the plague and they were not saved and they can just uh, thank it to their, their own unpreparedness that they, they could not be saved. So in a way one can see certain considerate attitudes but also uh, quite uh, selfish uh, concentration of uh, one's own ability. So this, this lockdown can also cause very much um, selfishness, egoism, which um, is an undesirable consequence, of course. And I, I think a very interesting part of your presentation was that you were talking about segregation, not in local context, but in macro context, the, the, the no, I mean, the empire where, uh, where you showed us this list of cities that kept growing and growing in a way kind of, it was like a blacklist, right? And we see the same thing here that first you stop moving, I mean, bringing people from Wuhan and then uh, th there's this list that is being uh, kind of developed and, and evolves over time. Caitlin? I see Irina's hand, Irina. Just quickly, but uh, the issue of segregation, of course, is very interesting in, in urban situations where you have very abrupt changes in the fabric and the, um, the demographics of one area and another. 
um, in the case of the slums in 19th century London, I, I became fascinated by them simply because I could not quite picture them because they were completely raised down and they disappeared as a, as a form. But they were not segregated. They were right in the center of town. They were often hidden behind semi-respectable facades or very, very close proximity to, to some of the um, rich parts of town. So for example, uh, St. Giles Rookery was right in the center and close to uh, uh, Regent Street. Uh, but what's interesting about the epidemic, uh, the consequences of epidemics was exactly that the segregation was somehow um, rendered insignificant. Uh, and this is what caused the political action ultimately, the fact that the disease was just around the corner and it was coming to get you no matter how much money you had. Uh, and then you had enough, uh, enough uh, uh, capital, financial and social to actually lobby the powers that be and change the course of action. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting that it, it worked both ways. The segregation formed uh, these foci of infection, but at the same time, um, it was uh, abolished by, or it was attempted to be uh, abolished by, by um, centralized measures. So we'll close it out with Andrew. Andrew, what thoughts do you want to share? Yeah, well, I just, um, I mean, I'm really interested in, in the comments of, of the previous three, but just to refer to what Irina was saying, that the context, the sort of uh, political historical context in which these epidemics take place is very important as well with regards to the questions of, of whether or not the disease is a great leveler. And I think the example of Bristol is instructive here because of the two outbreaks that took place during the Civil War, one uh, which was of typhus and that happened in 1643 affected everybody equally. Like, there was not much difference in who was affected in what parish. The whole city was affected. But two years later, um, after the capture of the city by the parliamentarians, there was another outbreak of bubonic plague, which was also severe, but which tended to be, uh, which tended to affect the poorer parishes more than the more than the wealthier. And, and another interesting aspect as, as to as to relating the uh, zoning, the physical zoning of a city with the economic communities as well, is that over time. Uh, you often got wealthier individuals who in Bristol, as I said, occupied that sort of middle third of the city, moving into poorer areas because it was higher up, because um, they had uh, the ability to escape the stink, which was really bad in Bristol during the summer. Um, they, uh, they moved up to St Michael's Hill and it became, by the late 18th century, quite a well-to-do neighbourhood. So, so you, you actually had this sort of repurposing of, of areas as well. Thank you. So I realize that we have gone well beyond our, our advertised um, endpoint, um, but I'm really thrilled that we're able to answer so many questions. I want to thank our participants for sending us really wonderful questions. I wanted to just offer a brief moment to see if any of our panelists wanted to share any reflections or insights that have come up for them um, in participating here. Carlo, I see your I see your hands. So we'll take maybe Carlo and maybe one or two more after this. Thank you. Uh, since we talk about prisoners of war and current times and um, political context, I want to notice that in the 16th century, we were in the middle of a war and um, uh, it was in, in my PhD research, I'm studying the um, uh, redemption of uh, Christian slaves and they were usually quarantined in uh, ships for 40 days be before entering, before going back to Sicily. Uh, one thing that I want to notice that is different from today and that we can learn from that era is that uh, even today in Sicily, when uh, migrants from Africa are coming uh, to, to the coast of Sicily, it was uh, difficult for Lampedusa and Italian authorities to organize uh, safe ships for quarantine. Well, it was uh, really easy and it was a uh, normality in the 16th century. So this is uh, something that really impressed me because it was the normality of, from the period I was studying back then, but today it was like some hard thing to do. And, uh, and so uh, this is something that uh, I think that was the, um, the aim of this, um, this seminar to learn from the past and from some solution of the past, just only this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any last thoughts or observations, Fariba? Yeah, um, coming from um, 
California, where we have all kinds of natural disasters, our governor is telling us that we have to next worry about fires, um, earthquakes, you know, uh, every day, uh, pandemics, of course, less often. I was, you know, wondering as urban historians whether we can take a bit of holistic approach, you know, especially to some cities like Istanbul, just like, you know, Los Angeles, you know, went through all these problems and maybe point in the direction of the impact of climate change. I think we have been avoiding that. And, um, and of course, you know, it's in the background, politicians avoid it right now. And I think we need to, as responsible scholars, you know, maybe point in that direction a bit. Thank you. And Amory, I see your hand. Yeah, I started my presentation with a reflection that um, in the UK, there was a pandemic simulation in 2016 and the consequences or the results of that were ignored. The government was distracted with Brexit and I think rich countries, rich uh, governments have hubristically assumed that epidemics were not a thing for us. We've got that. We have science, we have medicine, we've got hospitals, we've had antibiotics since the middle of the 20th century. We've got that down. And this has come as a massive wake up call because, you know, there's Zika virus or there's Ebola, but it's somewhere else. And all of a sudden, the rich Western societies have realized that we need to address this as well. My Anxiety, however, and those of you who are in the UK or who watch politics in the UK will be aware that um, events are moving really rapidly and any optimism, uh, optimism I may have had a few weeks ago is beginning to ebb away about the future, I have to say. So with that, um, this is my attempt to rather inelegantly end us. I want to thank everyone for their observations, um, for their thoughts, for their case studies, for their fantastic questions. This has truly been a phenomenal community effort. It's been great to work across space and time. So I wanna thank our panelists, also our participants. Um, Mohammed, are there any thoughts that you wanna share no, before we I, end? I, I wanted to echo your, 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 your comments. Uh, we are really grateful to our panelists because at least you and I know how much they worked in the last uh, seven weeks. It was just day and night working on their lectures and revising them. And so we are really grateful to them and all people who joined us and, uh, and probably the, the audience, the YouTube audience. It's a new experience for all of us. And uh, we, I wanna emphasize that this is the beginning of an initiative. Uh, so we will continue our efforts and uh, and uh, just stay tuned, tuned, yeah. Great, so with that, let's say thank you everyone. We really appreciate it. Take good care, stay safe, stay healthy.